Hi everyone and welcome to the fifth part of this series on well-modeled LES. In today's episode we're going to look at ODE wall models. So let's recall that PD models solved the RANS equations. This is equation 8 on this slide. Okay, so the idea of ODE models is to simplify these equations in such a way that you only have derivative in the wall normal direction. So therefore you get a ODE instead of a PDE. And the first step of a simplification which is made is that we take this viscous stress term and we ignore the derivatives in the wall parallel directions. So we only leave the D dx2 um, out of all the, all the three. And also we here removed the RANS uh, stress tensor and instead lumped it with the viscosity by using a uh, turbulence viscosity uh, approach. Okay, so now this is only dependent on x2, uh, but of course we also have the right-hand side, which still depends on the wall parallel directions as well. So the whole idea of ODE modeling is somehow treating this term in such a way that we don't have to actually compute these um, wall parallel derivatives. And the simplest approach is basically, for example, set this to zero, and then we have a so-called equilibrium ODE wall model. Uh, but we can uh, try to do better than that. Uh, we can try to retain some of these terms or uh, somehow model them. For example, recall how we treated the pressure gradient term in the PDE models. What we said there is basically that uh, through the inner layer the pressure doesn't change that much. So we're just going to assume that the wall normal gradient of pressure is zero. And then we can just say that we will sample the pressure gradient term from the uh, point where we get the LES solution, so for a distance h from the wall. We're just going to get our pressure gradient from there and then we don't have to solve uh, for the pressure anymore because we say that basically it's uh, uh, distributed as a constant uh, throughout the inner layer. So we can do something similar for our PD, uh, sorry, for our ODE model uh, as well. Then we also have this convective term and here unfortunately we can no longer say that uh, it remains constant throughout the inner layer, this is simply not true. Uh, so there are two possible solutions. One is to just remove it or we can try to somehow model it. And uh, the problem here is that really nobody almost have tried. So the only paper I know on modeling the acceleration is this preprint by Hickel and colleagues uh, available in archive. Uh, I'm not sure if it ever became a uh, published, uh, published article in some peer-reviewed journal. I have not found it at least. Um, and also this study is uh, sort of a priori only, so they don't actually run a wall model with, uh, uh, with a suggested uh, type of modeling for the acceleration term. They only test uh, possible models uh, for the acceleration in an a priori setting using some kind of uh, database. So this leaves the question regarding whether it's appropriate to only consider the pressure gradient term in an ODE model. So just leave the pressure gradient and remove the convection term. And there's a conflict of opinion regarding this in the literature. So on the, other hand, on the one hand, sorry, if we look at this review paper by Larson and colleagues, then he says very clearly that if we want to retain one term, in the case as left-hand side, but in our notation right-hand side of this equation, then we must retain them all. Uh, and the argument for that is that quite often the pressure gradient and the acceleration term actually balance each other out. Uh, so if you only retain one of them, then you can get a completely unrealistic uh, representation of your flow to the wall model. Uh, because, for example, they should balance each other out, so it should be approximately zero this right-hand side, but you only keep uh, the pressure gradient term. So uh, in a region where you have a significant pressure gradient, you will overfeed uh, the ODE with uh, this large uh, source term. Uh, on the other hand, it doesn't really uh, stop people from trying these models out and claiming that they uh, work better in a situation where a strong pressure gradient is present. So there are several such works. For example, you can look at this uh, Duprat and colleagues from 2011, uh, where they look at uh, periodic hill flow and uh, they get better results with, a, with an ODE model which uh, incorporates this uh, uh, pressure gradient term. So I, I would say it still remains a, an open question, essentially, of how to treat this. It seems like, uh, for, at least for some flows, it can be useful to retain the pressure gradient term, but whether 
one gets a good generally applicable wall model out of this remains a yeah it remains a point of investigation okay so one thing we can realize is that in the simplest case when we only have one ode uh, based on the momentum uh, which is the case when we have an incompressible flow uh, we can actually integrate the ode uh, so that we get rid of a wall normal derivative as well um, so let's now uh, first uh, contract this whole right hand side to something we call fi which is uh, independent of uh, well, essentially, it's a constant. So we either, we either sample or ignore these terms. So it's independent of y and also independent, or sorry, independent of x2 and also independent of x1 and x3, right? So it's just a constant. Uh, so what we do then is then we integrate in the wall normal direction. So we put an integral sign uh, for both uh, left and right hand side. And uh, <clears throat> what we get is uh, basically here, we just get what is under the derivative because we integrate the derivative with respect to uh, x2 and we integrate along x2 so the only thing which is left is just what is under the derivative and here since uh, this thing is independent of x2 uh, basically we just get f1 times x2 right and also very importantly of course we get an integration constant out of both of these but we can lump them into one constant which we call c and uh, the way things are done uh, when we solve this type of ODE problem is that uh, to figure out the integration constant we can look at uh, boundary conditions and in particular, uh, if we look at the condition at x2 equal to 0, that is at the wall, uh, then of course this term disappears. So what is left on the right hand side is c. And on the left hand side, we have a wall normal derivative of uh, the velocity profile without the contribution of uh, turbulent uh, viscosity, because of course at the wall it is 0. And wow, what we suddenly see is that, hey, here's our tau wall right so this is the mean uh, tau wall so great now we have uh, plugged in tau wall into this little equation of ours and can express it so here it is our equation now that we've plugged in tau wall instead of uh, the integration constant c so the way we can proceed is actually integrate this one more time in order to get an explicit expression for tau wall uh, the first step towards this is uh, dividing both uh, left and right hand side by this nu plus nu t. So we do that. Now what we have on the left hand side is only the wall normal derivative. And here, of course, it appears as a division factor. Good. Now we can integrate both sides from 0 to h. And recall that h is this distance along the wall normal direction to the uh, sampling point where we connect the LES and the uh, where we sample the LES solution for the wall model. So, all right, we put the integration sign from zero to H for all of these terms. And uh, of course, uh, if we look here, what we have is the derivative with respect to X2 integrated. So the only thing we need to do is evaluate uh, UI at H, which gives us this value. So basically what we sample from the LES and minus the evaluation of velocity at zero, which is simply zero due to the no slip condition. So the only thing we have left on the left hand side is this ui at uh, at uh, the wall normal different distance h, sorry. And uh, on the right hand side, we cannot really do anything because uh, we don't know what uh, new t is, right? So and it depends on y. So we cannot really uh, go any further. So basically we have these two integrals left. Uh, however, we can now uh, explicitly express uh, the wall shear stress in terms of the other terms. So if we do that after some very simple manipulations, we get this expression for the wall stress components. So this is uh, not, com we're not completely done, right? Since we still have these integrals, uh, but they can be computed numerically. So what you do is basically introduce uh, some kind of 1D grid uh, for each wall phase between zero and H and uh, use that with your favorite numerical integration method. The simplest one can be, I don't know, trapezoidal or Simpson's method, doesn't matter, uh, to evaluate these uh, two integrals. And then you can get uh, the value of the wall shear stress components. Now, as usual, the same as with the PDE models, right? So here the whole thing is written for the mean quantity, the mean tau wall and the mean velocity. But what we are interested in is the filtered velocity based on the filtered, uh, sorry, the filtered uh, wall shear stress based on the filtered velocity. So what we can do is simply say, well, we're going to approximate the mean quantities with the filtered ones. 
that is what is uh, typically done. Alternatively, of course, one can uh, try to introduce some uh, time averaging of a filtered quantity over some time period, etc. Uh, but uh, the most obvious choice is just to ignore the difference and say that uh, we're going to make an approximation. Okay, so uh, this is basically all we have to say about the uh, ODE models. Let's just uh, recap their pros and cons. So starting with the pros, um, yeah, and by the way, we're going to distinguish uh, the two formulations. So one we will call non-integrated, that is when we still have an ODE that we need to solve with some kind of ODE solver, right? Um, and the second formulation is the integrated one, which is when we did this uh, second round of integration to get an explicit expression for the tau wall. So the good thing about the non-integrated ones is that they're good when you have a compressible flow situation, which is not something we consider here. Uh, but then you have a system of ODEs, uh, one for the velocity, for the momentum, and one for the temperature, basically. And uh, since those can be coupled together quite strongly, it's, uh, it's good to have them in one single ODE system, which uh, you can then solve. Uh, now, looking at the integrated versions, uh, one good thing about it is it's very stable, right? So the only thing you need to do uh, in order to compute tau wall is uh, compute uh, some integrals numerically, and this is a very stable procedure. It's definitely not going to diverge or do anything nasty to you. Uh, also, it's non-iterative, right? It's explicit. There is no iterative method involved. You just compute the numerical numerically the, in, the two integrals, and you're done. You have an explicit uh, expression for the wall shear stress. Um, now about the cons. So if we consider the non-integrated version, then Obviously, we need a way to solve the ODEs. So what you have to do is implement an ODE solver, right? So at each wall face, you will solve an ODE. And yeah, you need to discretize it somehow on a 1D grid from 0 to H, et cetera, et cetera. Implement an appropriate method for solving it. Uh, that is relatively resource consuming, right? It, as far as wall modeling goes, of course, it's not going to be much of a chunk of LES you're doing probably, but still it's it's relatively resource consuming. And uh, also uh, for both integrated and not integrated, there's also this um, small caveat that we already seen in the PD models is that this 1D grid uh, has to actually be adapted to uh, Y plus at each phase, right? So it's not entirely independent of the uh, inner link scale because uh, we have to integrate through the whole inner layer. So, um, that's uh, in, in some sense um, not very good, right? Because ideally we want to completely ignore these inner scales, but it doesn't matter that much, uh, honestly, since because um, since here we're working with a 1D, uh, 1D equations. So it's really not such a big deal as it was in um, the PD models where we had to solve a full rant. It's uh, uh, by comparison, a much smaller effort. Okay, so uh, finally, the last con is that uh, this treatment of uh, Fi, this right-hand side of the ODE. So the, the, the problem is, are we winning anything if we are not really treating it uh, well? Uh, do we win? Do we get any more physics compared to simpler models, which are algebraic models, which we'll touch upon the, um, or actually look in detail in the, in the next video? And the answer really is uh, no, you don't really get much much extra. So uh, it, it's a little bit unclear in what situation you would want to use it uh, as compared to a more widespread and a somewhat simpler algebraic model. Uh, I, I think one of the stronger, strongest cases for ODE models is, um, is this compressible flow situation where you need a tightly coupled system for um, the momentum and the, and the temperature wall model. Uh, otherwise, most of the time, you're equally good with, uh, with an algebraic model. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Maybe some people think differently. Okay, so this concludes today's video. And uh, now we're done with PDE models and ODE models. And what remains is algebraic models. And that's going to be the subject of the next video. Stay tuned and bye for now.